take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, and I want to speak to you on the strength we need, the strength we all need. Uh, We all face the problem of tiredness and exhaustion. As a matter of fact, one of the most common refrains I hear is, I'm tired. How you doing? Tired. How you doing? Really tired. And for some, that's physical exhaustion or tiredness. For others, it is emotional and even spiritual. But the answer to our exhaustion, the strength that we need, believe it or not, is not trying harder, pushing more. Fact is that we are stressed out, overworked, overwrought, over worried, and that creates so much of this exhaustion. So what we need to do is to learn how to rely upon the resources that we have in Christ, to rest in the Lord and to rely upon the power of God, to trust God more, much more. You can over try, but you cannot over trust the Lord. Trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. And there is an inexhaustible strength that comes in our relationship with God who is the source of our strength. Sometimes I am asked, from time to time I am asked about the energy that I have to keep the schedule that I keep, fulfill the responsibilities that I have. And I can tell you that it is much more than physical strength, though I try to stay healthy and exercise and eat right, rest well, but it's more than physical strength. It's more than mental toughness. The source of my strength is the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And it's your strength as well. It's the principle that we find in this passage, which is the linchpin passage in all of the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. It's a prayer delivered by the Apostle Paul in prison that echoes through the centuries, and therefore it is a prayer for you and me as well. And this prayer is a prayer for strength. Verse 14, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant to you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled, watch this, with all the fullness of God. And then a doxology of praise that we have quoted many times here as we have prayed for our church. If you love your church, you will pray for your church. And this praise and doxology comes from our hearts. It is imprinted, engraved on the side of our building. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And we all said, Amen. Amen. We do. If I could put this sermon in one sentence, it would be this, all of God in all of us. All of God in all of you. All of God in all of me. The secret of our strength is the power of Jesus Christ by His Spirit working in you. As I noted, this is Paul praying. 
He's in prison. He is a wounded warrior, broken, facing the end of his life. Some of us have been to the maritime prison in Rome. You can visit it today. Uh, it's somewhat of a shrine today, but in that day, uh, it was just a hell hole, a hole in the ground. The prisons in the ancient world were uh, terrible places. And Paul was at the bottom of this pit, and yet his spirit is free. He is alive in Christ. He is strengthened in the midst of these terrible circumstances, and he begins to pray. He hits a knee, and he begins to pray. He says, I bow my knee. Interestingly enough, bowing the knee, bowing in prayer is not mentioned that often in Scripture. The Scripture speaks of standing in prayer and walking in prayer and lifting up holy hands in prayer, but rarely kneeling in prayer. And yet it is this posture that speaks of our humility and surrender before God in prayer. It is our disposition before God, and it's good to pray. Always, you can pray singing, you can pray silently, you can pray walking, you can, you can pray sitting, you can pray laying on your bed, you can pray, pray laying on your face, and you can kneel before God. We often invite people to come forward here at Prestonwood and kneel during the invitation, perhaps today. You would sense the need to come to this place of decision and kneel as an act of surrender. And by your very posture, you are demonstrating your desire to know more and more of God and His grace. There's no one way, no one certain way to pray. The proper way for man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keyes, the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, nay, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms with wrapped and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Snow, such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing to the ground, said the Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year I fell in Hodgkin's well, head first, said Cyril Brown. With both my heels a sticking up and my head a pointing down. And I done prayed right then and there, the best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on my head. <laughs> so it's not the posture of our praying, but the power that comes from praying. It's been said you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Prayer is, is life's limitless reach. Prayer is when we link our nothingness, Spurgeon said, to His almightiness. It is in prayer that we are empowered and enabled to live the Christian life. We are strengthened in this prayer because of our wealth in Christ. Remember, uh, Ephesians 1 through 3 is all about our wealth and our worth in Christ, your identity in Christ, who you are and what you have because you are a believer in Christ. And chapters 1, 2, and 3, from eternity past to eternity future, all of these blessings of God that are ours. And he speaks here of being strengthened in the inner man with the riches, the riches of His glory. You are wealthy beyond your imagination. Did you know that? Your net worth is much more than you thought. Your portfolio is not here on earth or dependent upon the stock market or your bank account. You have something that money cannot buy and death cannot take away. You have Jesus and therefore all things in Him richly to enjoy. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are a child of the King. And it is out of these riches and glory that we rejoice. George Beverly Shea sang it years ago, I'd rather have Jesus 
than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than to have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by His nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or to be held in sin's great sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. We are enriched in Jesus Christ. Think about the billions and billions of blessings that are ours and the billions and billions of years that we will have to celebrate Him throughout all eternity. It's hard to imagine just how great are our resources and our riches in Christ. If you just read the first three chapters of Ephesians, you you can underline words like riches and wealth and inheritance and blessings. No wonder Paul hits a knee, bursts into prayer and includes the entire family of God from generation to generation, which means me and you. He speaks of the church here as being a spiritual family. The church is not a business. A business creates consumers and critics, but the church creates followers and family of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are God's church. This is an amazing prayer because it is a prayer for strength. I just was recounting some of the promises of strength that I have claimed over the years in the Bible. For example, Joshua 1 and verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then in Deuteronomy 33, it says, as your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. In other words, your strength will be equal to your days. If you are in Christ and you are receiving His resources daily, then everything you need that day is available to you. He goes on to say in verse 27, uh, the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. We are held in His grip, kept by the power of God. Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord seek to and throw run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. And therefore we are strengthened and the eyes of the Lord are here today. And if you call upon Him, He will strengthen you. Uh, Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Isaiah 30, 15, in quietness and in trust, shall be your strength. I can go on and on. Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary, walk and not faint. One less familiar, Habakkuk 3, 19, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places and to the choir master with stringed instruments. Uh, Mark 12, 30, let's flip to the New Testament. What did Jesus say? He said, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and with all your strength. And then, of course, Paul said in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm ready for anything, he said, because Christ strengthens me. What strength, what power we have in Christ. What does this mean? It means that we are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, then the Spirit of God lives in you. You are made alive in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. The question always is, does the Holy Spirit have you? You have all of the Spirit. Does the Spirit have all of you? And there's such tremendous strength in the Holy Spirit. How so? Well, it's the power to save. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the work of the Holy Spirit 
that saves us. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, not only to save us, but give us power to witness. But you shall receive power, Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. I was just reading this week concerning the witness of the church in the world today. And I was encouraged to read that worldwide, globally, and these are facts, there are over 80,000 people a day coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a massive movement of the Spirit of God around the world. Uh, For example, there have been more Muslim people saved in the past uh, 50 years than in the past 500 to 1,500 years before. Uh, We are seeing millions of people come to Christ, Bible-believing, born-again Christians in uh, the continent of South America. We're seeing it all across Eastern Europe. And in China, I was told when I visited China that there were hundreds of thousands of people coming to faith in Jesus, and it won't be long if it hasn't already happened, that China, because of the number of Christians in that country, will be, will have more Christians than any other nation in the world. I could go on and on. Eighty plus thousand people a day coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is at work in the world through His church, through His people. That's the good news. The bad news is that of these 80 plus thousand of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ every day, only 6,000 of these are living in the United States of America or in Western Europe. And the fact is in our country, many are turning away from Christ. More atheists reported and nuns, that is those who report no religious experience or faith in God than ever before. Western Europe, it's even worse. So as you can tell, we need revival in the church in America. We need revival in the church across Western Europe. What we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to fill us and use us for His glory. But it is the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to witness and the effectiveness of our witness. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us joyful hope. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The power of The Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome our fears and anxieties. There's so much fear and anxiety, it seems, in our country these days. But what does the Bible say? For God has given us a spirit not of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in our spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us power and provision for everything we need. His divine power, 2 Peter 1, 3, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us in His own glory and excellence. In everything, we have everything we need to live the Christian life. It's all present because the Holy Spirit lives in each one of us. For some of you, this is elementary truth. You've known this for a while, but it would be a good time just to bow your head and say, thank you, God, for your spirit alive in me. Some of you have grown up in churches where you've never heard of the Holy Spirit, where you've not been taught the truth of spirit-filled living. I'm grateful that I grew up in a church with a pastor who taught us how to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But some of you have never had that experience, so this is new truth to you, and I'm telling you, you need to make the discovery that the Christian life is the greatest discovery I made outside of my salvation, the discovery that the Christian life is not hard, it is impossible, but in Christ all things are possible. The Holy Spirit, the living presence of Jesus in you will enable you to live this Christian life, to overcome temptation. Uh, to witness of your faith, to, 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 uh, to be strengthened in the midst of any circumstance in your life. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the power of God. You know, it's interesting that this, this prayer is one long sentence. It's broken up into sentences in our uh, English language, but as Paul delivered it, as it was written, it was just one long sentence prayer. Uh, And not a long prayer, but just one prayer without a pause. It's as though Paul can't stop speaking and praying of all that God has done. So we are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the word for power here is the word dunamis. And it can mean authority, power, might, ability, or strength. So the strength that comes from within is the power that God gives. And we must plug in to this power. If you have a cell phone or a tablet or technology, you know that ultimately it runs down and you need to plug it in and regain the power. So it is in life, certainly in the Christian life. We must always be plugging in to this power. And this power is abundant. It's the power of God, the very power of God through Christ by His Spirit. The Trinity is at work here. You say, Trinity, yes, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all of the power of God. Remember, I said at the outset, all of God in all of me. This is our wealth. This is our worth. And it's an inner flow that comes from deep within. You know, you notice those fire hydrants that are around, and they're typically rather small, just a fire hydrant. But underneath, when the first responders or firemen are hooking up those hoses and engaging the current, out of underneath that fire hydrant, underneath is a powerful current that flows. And so it is within us. There is the current deep within us that empowers us and energizes us and enables us. We are strengthened by the presence of Christ. We know the riches of His grace. It's a relationship with God, and it is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you understand this, it is your position that will change your condition in life. Your position will change your condition. Your identity in Christ will change your reality. So, don't live beneath your blessings. Don't live beneath the privileges and the possessions that you have in Christ. Begin declaring who you are and what you have in Him. Stop saying, I can't, and start believing that you can by the power of God. Stop wondering and worrying about something that may look impossible when the God of the impossible is in you. You have a strength to overcome, to defeat the enemy, to defeat and destroy that addiction in your life, to overcome temptation, to live in victory, to rise out of the ashes of defeat in your life. You are not just a lowly worm. You are saved by the grace of God. The power of Jesus is in you. You are strengthened in Him every single day. Say it, declare it, and believe it. I'm a child of the King. I'm a member of God's eternal family. He lives in me. 
And then we are strengthened in the inner being. That's what he says here in verse 16. This is a great 316. There are many 316s in the Bible that you should know. You know John 316, but uh, Ephesians 316 says that according to the riches of His glory, that He might grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Now, your inner being, of course, is the soul, the spirit. Your body, your soul, you are spirit. Speaking of the innermost being, the part of you that is made for God, the core, the center of your life. Everything else is circumference. When Christ is at the center, at the core of your life, controlling your attitudes, your dispositions, your directions, your decisions in life, the more and more you will become like Him and glorify Him. And that's the goal, is to be more and more like Christ. You are not just a bunch of chemicals. You at the core are made for God to know God. And if you are a Christian, He is in you. And that means though the outer man, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, though the outer man is wasting away, decay, the inner person can be strengthened every single day. We are strengthened from deep within. This is the secret of our strength. This is how you keep going and never quit because Christ is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says in verse 17 something very important, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. I like the way the Living Bible gives this. He says, I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust Him, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, of course, we invite people to receive Christ, to invite Christ into your heart. And certainly this expresses that idea that when you receive Christ, you are inviting Christ, that Christ would dwell in your heart. It's true. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. So it's proper to pray and invite Christ into your heart. And while that is gloriously true, what this verse is actually speaking about when it says, let Christ be at home in your heart, let Christ dwell in your heart, it's really It's really describing something of letting Christ be comfortable in your life. Let welcome Christ, let Him be at home in your life. In other words, your life is not a hotel where Christ moves in and out, but His permanent residence. Your heart is Christ's home. He lives within. If someone comes to your house, you may say to them, make yourself at home. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that you want them rummaging through your closet or your garage uh, or your personal items and things. You know, make yourself at home means to a certain degree. But you're saying, be comfortable here. here. My house is your house. Well, in a much greater degree, when Christ dwells, abides in our lives, He is to make Himself at home. Is Christ at home in your heart? Robert Boyd, Robert Boyd Munger wrote a little booklet called My Heart, Christ's Home. And in it, he was describing the heart as a home where Christ would be comfortable, where Christ would be Lord of life and Lord of all. He described the heart as a home that had a dining room where we fulfilled our appetites and a kitchen and a living room and a bedroom and all the rooms that you might have in a house, all the compartments 
and all, the, all of the closets and all of the crevices. And Munger described this, this Christian life as allowing Jesus to take His rightful place of lordship, preeminence, not just a place in our lives, but preeminence in all of our lives. Does Christ have all your heart? Does He have every room in your life, including those secret places that nobody else knows about it? Oh, He knows about them. But you must be willing to say, Lord, come in and clean out this closet. Lord, rearrange. Do you watch the fixer-uppers? Yeah. Waco is really happy about the fixer-uppers. And they can take an old house that's broken down. It's amazing. Take a broken down house that nobody wants and transform it in something beautiful and wonderful and the family celebrates when they get uh, to go in. Well, Jesus is the ultimate fixer-upper. He comes into our hearts, the home of our lives, and He cleans things up and He renovates everything. My heart is Christ's home. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? He strengthens us in the heart by the Holy Spirit because He dwells within us. Then next, He strengthens us in His love. He strengthens us in His love. Verse, six, uh, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ. The word know there means to grasp it, to experience it, to apprehend it, to understand it more and more. The breadth, the length, the depth, the height. When you read the commentators on this passage describing the love of Jesus Christ. You're amazed at the wonder of His love. And it is this love that strengthens us every single day. You might describe the height, the breadth, the length, the depth of His love right out of John 3.16. How wide is God's love? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. How long is the love of God? Long enough that He sent His Son Jesus into the world, left heaven, came to this world so that we would never perish. How deep is the love of God that whoever believes, whoever believes, you and me will have eternal life. And how high is the love of God that you would have everlasting life. It's been described as the cross, this height and depth and breadth and length of the love of God. If you really want to know it, it's like measuring the immeasurable. It's like knowing the unknowable in so many ways. And yet by the Spirit, we can learn more and more and more and experience more of God's love every single day. But the the Christians of the first century often spoke of the cross in this way. The vertical bar, the horizontal bar, the depth of the cross, the length of the cross, the width of the cross. If you want to know the love of God, then look at Jesus on the cross. For God demonstrated His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it is the love of God, knowing that we are so loved, that strengthens us every single day of our lives. From eternity present, eternity past, eternity future. Never stop learning more and more of the love of God. When Deb and I got married in 1970, yes, 50 years ago this year, it was a nine month romance and then a marriage like the birth of a baby, nine months. There was no baby, but there was a marriage. (laughs) There were babies later. But, you know, that first love, college sweetheart, exciting, wonderful. But I can tell you that as our love has grown through the years, all these years and years, 
that I love her more than I could have possibly loved her then because in the maturing of love, in the developing of love, there is a greater love and more and more. And my prayer is, you know, we have shared so much in life and shared so much in ministry and shared so much with children and now grandchildren. This just increases the love that you have for one another. And as you walk with the Lord, as you experience His grace, His mercy, His goodness, His provision all through the years, you just learn to love Him more and more. And I can tell you this, no one loves you more than Jesus. No one ever cared for me or you like Jesus. There's only a few people in the world that really love you, family and a few friends, in the love that I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, above all others, Christ loves you. Now, how does that make you feel when you hear that? Do you dismiss it because you've heard it again and again and again, God loves you? You deny it? Do you deny it because perhaps you're living in sin and you've wandered away from God and His, and His love in your life? Do you just dismiss it? Do you deny it? Or do you embrace it, this love of God in Jesus Christ? When you embrace His love, you receive His power. Because the greatest power in the world is the power of love, God's great love. It is inexhaustible, it is indescribable, it is incomprehensible, but we have a lifetime and then an eternity to experience this love. To be filled with His love is to be controlled by His Lordship. And then one last thing. For it says in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, all of God in all of you, all of Christ in all of your heart. The goal of your life should be all of Christ, none of me. Now, that's not just pious, religious spirituality. It is the reality of someone who is in Christ. When we pray that we ask God to fill us, not just part of us, but all of us, all of Christ is in us. But when we pray like Paul prayed, when we pray a prayer like this and empty our lives of self and sin, then God has all of us. He controls us. He dominates us. He lives large in our lives, and He is glorified, and that's the goal. The goal of your life should be to glorify God. The ambition of every Christian should be, I want to be like Christ. And that happens when we are emptied more and more of self and filled more and more with Him. I can tell you that through the years, there have been times when I've just had to get alone with God and say, God. I've taken back some things. I've done some things that do not please you. But Lord, I ask you now, as I confess my need to fill me and use me and glorify yourself, I give you my life. I give you my wife. I give you my family. I give you our friends. I give you our church. I give you our ministry. I give you uh, my reputation. Just to say, Lord, I take hands off and give you the control of my life. That's the powerful prayer that we ought to pray. And then do you know what happens? That doxology. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above 
and beyond all that we could think, hope, imagine, pray, dream, desire. God will do so much more with your life, much more when you are emptied of self and full of Him.